Um, Jay, I think I'm going to mispronounce your last name because I can't read it very well. Uh, from New Richmond. Must have come down. Is there a J344 Grand <laughs> Avenue? Wolf. Is it Wolf? Again. It might be. Yeah, that might be. Is it? <laughs> All right. I'm going to go with you, Jay. Uh, it's close enough. You Thank you. I can't write. That's okay. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> bills that, you, first of all, you find a majority of people put you into office, and then when you find a majority of people who are against certain bills, how can you come up with a mindset, and what goes into that for you can vote against the majority of the people who put you in the office in the first place? Yeah. So I'm just curious how that works. Yeah, real quickly, you know, it, it's not an exact science. I, I try to review everything that comes into my office, from phone calls to emails to messages to letters, so I know what people are thinking. And it's very hard to ascertain where everyone is in, in a congressional district this size and this diverse, 690,000 people at a given moment. Because a lot of, most people don't weigh in. They don't send information in where they stand on a particular piece of legislation or not. So part of my job, I view, is trying to have listening sessions like this to get a sense of what people are thinking and feeling out there, making sure I'm accessible back home, making sure I'm reviewing things that come into the office so I have a, a good feel of where the congressional district, the people in the congressional district are. But I also think part of my job is to go a little bit deeper. I mean, I, you guys hire me to be your representative, to get into the weeds and the detail of the legislation. To first of all, read it, to understand it, and try to understand the consequences back home here. Most people don't have that time in their days to go through every bill, every piece of legislation, and try to weigh the pros and cons and how, what the ultimate impact is. That's part of my job description. And I try to do it as transparently as possible. I try to do it in an honest fashion. And I try to offer the people my best judgment at the, at the end of the day. And that's all I can offer, really, is my best judgment. There'll be times when you dis disagree with me. There'll be times you agree with me. But... I've got to offer my best judgment uh, w w when I'm confronted with these issues. Sometimes they move very fast. Sometimes they're very complicated and very in-depth and detailed in that. But uh, uh, that's part of the duties as I see it. Did you find a majority of the people who contacted you with, over emails were for or against? A majority. Would you find them for or against the health care bill? The health care bill? Yeah. I'd say it was pretty split in the district. I was hearing passion on both sides that ran deep on both sides. There were some who thought the only solution is a single-payer government-run health care system. And then there were others who didn't have any interest in health care reform whatsoever. And then there was that young mother who came up to me a couple of weeks before the final debate and vote who told me, Ron, I just lost my job. And because I lost my job, my family lost the insurance coverage that we got through our job. But my 12-year-old daughter was just diagnosed with cancer. And because she has cancer, she has a pre-existing condition, and we cannot find any affordable health care coverage for her. We are depleting our entire life savings just to make sure that she still has access to some health care. And I was thinking, you know, in a country as great as ours, we can do better. We have to do better than that. And with so many people, because of pre-existing conditions, were impossible for them to get any type of coverage. And then shortly after the vote, a young man, 21 years old, came up and thanked me for my health care vote. and said, was there something in particular that was important in health care reform? I said, yeah. A couple of years ago, my younger brother needed a kidney. And I gave him one of mine. But because I gave him my kidney, I'm being treated now as if I have a pre-existing condition, even though I'm perfectly healthy. And it's just, just, it's just not right. And we've got to work hard to try to overcome those deficiencies uh, that exist. So yeah, the passion ran pretty deep on, on both sides when it came to health care reform. And it's not a perfect bill. It's going to be a work in progress, and we're going to need the help and the feedback from people from across the country to let us know what is working, what isn't working, so we can make adjustments to it. Thank you. It's good to hear from you. Tammy Tollefson? Hi, Tammy. Hey, nice to see you. I'm glad you're here today. Hey, I'm a, a victim of one of the largest telecommunications companies in the world. Mm. AT&T is my uh, landline provider, and unfortunately, they won't bring DSL to my house. Now, a lot of people here probably suffer from the same problem I have, is that we cannot get broadband internet connectivity that is decent. And I know that there was a small portion of the stimulus package for rural development focusing directly on broadband to underserved and unserved communities. Where I live, I work from home, and I work for an organization that's in, the, in Washington, D.C., I 
de depend on my internet connectivity for my living. And there are a lot of other um, economic development issues that surround this, along with a lot of um, students at the uh, River Falls uh, schools um, have this roadblock because a lot of their assignments are based on um, internet connectivity, being able to watch a video and then write a, you know, a thesis about it or something like that. And so um, I'm wondering when we might be able to be seeing some kind of uh, change in that direction. I know people who live in the city or the city limits have access to that, but when you get out to the outlying areas, unless you have a small mom and pop who literally care about every um, customer, uh, you're, I'm kind of stuck. <laughs> you know, Tammy, I, I hear you. What Tammy's raising is broadband access for all Americans is what I hear. Whether you're in the city, whether you're in the rural area, I think it's important that we have a national broadband strategy to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. There was some funding under the Recovery Act you know, to try to get into this last mile issue, and that's really what we're talking about, where it's not that economically feasible for private companies to be making that last mile connection mm -hmm. because of the payback. But I think it's crucial for the future uh, prosperity and development of rural communities, and especially important for our students and young people. If we're going to keep them in rural America, they've got to have access to broadband. I mean, it's, just in a, it's an appendage of theirs today. They ex expect to have connection to the Internet and broadband communication, and it's going to be important for American competitiveness as we move forward. So just six, six years ago, we were number one in the, in the world when it came to broadband connectivity. Today, we're 18. If we want to remain the most innovative and creative nation in the world, we've got to figure this out. And we've got to do it quickly because other countries are flying past us. And I, I tell you, I get so frustrated. Here's my big pet peeve in representing western Wisconsin. When I'm on my cell phone traveling around, I get into the coolies of the valleys. I think everyone's been there. You get the drop call. The, you can't get connected in that. You've got high-speed trains running through tunnels in Japan with its uninterrupted service. Uninterrupted service. We've got to do better if we're going to remain competitive uh, with the rest of the world. Thank you. Uh, Sue Beckham? Oh, Sue here? Great. Hi, Sue. Thanks Hi. for joining us. Um, yes. I didn't prepare a speech. I subscribe to the beliefs of Nobel economist Paul Krugman. And I believe that to create prosperity, you've got to spend money. And I believe that the deficit this country's facing is not all that important if we can use the deficit to create. Um, I want to know what you are going to do, what everybody's going to do about using public money to create jobs. I've got one son who's out of work and uh, has run out of unemployment twice and somebody in Washington has bailed him out both times want them to keep on, but I want him to have a job. Mm -hmm. Another son who's underemployed. So um, I just wanted to make that point about the need for the government to spend money we may not have yet to create jobs, so we will have it then. Yeah, so it's a great question, it's a legitimate question, but I, I do believe that we've got to continue to work with the free market system we have in this country, and it's going to be the private sector that's going to be the locomotive. that has got to get back on track, helping to create jobs. But there are certain functions that the private sector just won't invest in, and they won't go because it's not going to be that profitable to them. One, one big area, Medicare. And there's a reason why Medicare was created, because seniors were having a hard time getting affordable health care. Because as you grow older, you tend to consume more health care. And the insurance companies know it, and therefore they didn't want to cover it seniors in their later stages of life. And that's one of the reasons why Medicare was, was created, in order to deal with the, something that the private sector wasn't doing themselves. Border security. And they're not going to find a lot of private companies investing a lot of money when it comes to border security. It's something we've got to do as a sovereign nation. So there's going to be you know, some spending and jobs created in that area. Law enforcement, education, teaching in these functions. We just had a study that came out showing for-profit private colleges are, are doing a horrible job as far as making sure that students get a good bang for their buck. They're typically 50% more expensive. You've got a 40% increase in student loan defaults with private for-profit colleges than not-for-profit universities. And there are reasons for it because it is oftentimes driven by the bottom line and they're not offering a very good service. So we have to maintain that the right balance as far as the investments in both the public and the private sector in order to get this economy uh, back on track again. talking about anything you responded to, and I know private for profit colleges are mm -hmm. the worst investment anybody can make. Yeah, so just that's right. 
Yeah, thank you.